Awesome. Uh, thank you again for coming. Um, today, I'm hoping to go through kind of the basics and best practices for creating data sources in Tableau. Specifically, I'm going to take a minute at the beginning to talk about how we would break down a SciSense query in thinking about it in terms of a Tableau data source. And so you can follow along. I've kind of given an outline in the agenda, um, but it's going to be talking about the, that mapping a SciSense query to a Tableau data source. Then we're going to um, work through building a data source um, and talk about a couple elements of that relationships and joins. And then we're going to kind of, as we're looking at that data source, we're going to go through a list of kind of best practices um, for creating data sources. So I'm going to start with sharing my screen and we're going to, if you want to follow along or look at the same SciSense query, it's linked in the agenda. Awesome. So this is the uh, linked SciSense query. Uh, the On the surface, right, this is a very simple query, um, but as you may know that these are nested items. So what we, we need to look at this whole query, but we also need to look at this part of the query so we can completely understand what's happening. So as we look through this, um, we're looking for a few things. We're looking for tables. We're looking for joins. We're looking for custom columns. We're looking for calculations. We're looking for any place we've renamed a column. Generically speaking, Everything that happens before the final select statement, this final, so before this, that happens in CTEs, so all of this, all of this, we're going to convert into a data source in Tableau. Um, there's a little bit of back and forth, like the filter, we need to make sure that the filters that were here, so these filters can be answered. We need to make sure that fields that we're going to filter on later need to get passed all the way through. But the afterwards, so after that final CTE, mo most of this stuff here can be, you know, even all these filters, those can be done in the visualization. So we make a data source and then we can make a chart. And so what we're seeing in this part of the query, we should be able to, we want to construct it so we can build it as part of the chart versus having it kind of baked in to the data source. So some differences where here there's a couple of filters on the data source itself. Um, so those will be baked in so that someone couldn't change them. Like we want this data source to always be filtered to this, for example, or age in days is always greater than or equal to zero. And then someone could make a viz off of that data source, but they couldn't change that filter. That filter will be baked into the data itself as opposed to having one of these filters where the state is opened. That's something where someone creating the visualization would be able to select that because state would be a provided field and they could say, well, I want to actually look at a state closed versus state opened, for example. Um, call Again, column renaming and calculated fields. These are things that we can then translate into a data source because we want to remember that one of the primary purposes of creating a data source is to create a curated experience, a curated environment, so that individuals aren't aren't going in and creating these queries, but they have access to the data that they need. Um, so, like what we do here with this query, this is this is reducing the number of total available columns, where we're going to rename them so they're meaningful. That's what this this infra dev issues was trying to do, and we're going to translate that again into a data source. Um, any questions um, kind of on this mapping? There, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's lots of little nuances to get into, but generically, um, are there any questions? Uh, maybe you know this now, or maybe you'll know it in the future. I know that right now it's not the focus, but once we're you know, picture a year after we've settled into Tableau. Do you think it will be better for us to put logic such as this SLO breach counter in the data sources, whether that be a DBT model or in a custom SQL query or to 
make those calculated fields. So basically to bring them down mm -hmm. to the workbook. What, what our, do you think? Our guidance, be the guidance right now and the principle that we're trying, going to be working towards is business logic in code. Now, so that would lead us to say anything that we can put materialized in a, in a table in the in the or in the code, say in DBT, we want to. But there's always going to be some level where we will have calculate calculated fields within the within the visualization tool, things that have to be calculated based on what you're building. Um, and so those are always going to be there, but our what, what using the principles or guidance, we're going to minimize those. So if these are if these are pre-calculated fields, these are a good example that these could just exist probably in the data source. They don't depend on the granularity within the visualization itself. They aren't dependent on anything like that. So these could probably go down into the database tables, but there's there's never going to be a rule that says you can't use calculated columns in Tableau. We just want to un the, we want to use the principle of business logic in code. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions on kind of the mapping of a SciSense query to a data source? Excellent. Um, like I said, there's more nuances, and if people have questions, we can talk about them. But I just want to give that kind of primer. Um, because we want to, with data sources, we want to move past using custom queries. Uh, they are more brittle. And again, they're hiding business logic. They're underneath all these layers of Tableau. And they're very hard to get to and hard for people to document and, and look at. And they're non-transparent, to put it into a GitLab value. So we want to try, when we need to build a data source in Tableau, we want to use Tableau data modeling. So let's look at that. Well, this one, um, I'll start with a new sheet here. Um, and I've linked a data source. I've linked a model, rather. I'll go back to that now, actually. Let's look at that first. Uh, this one, yes. So I've linked a model. Um, is issues history model. I'm not going to try and recreate this entire thing. There's lots of business logic in here. Um, I'm using it mostly because it's tables that the, the you might be familiar with. Um, and specifically, I'm going to try and recreate um, a few of these joins, maybe just one, um, depending on what kind of questions that we have. Um, so as we look at this model, we're seeing, I'm, I'm, see, I'm going to look, I've, I've practiced this, but I'm going to, so let's take a look at this one, the severity. So we need the label groups, and it's getting joined to, looks like it's, there's a connection between issues here and dates. And if we follow those back up, we can see... Uh, what the tables are. So we have this issues, internal issues enhanced. We need label history, and we're going to be looking at dim date. So the idea is we're going to try and, again, we're using the Tableau data modeling, we're going to rebuild this, talk about how, how we're doing that. So as I go into Tableau, I'm going to start start from the fresh. I've already I've already done this, so we can, if I mess up, we can always just focus on that. But we're going to start start from start from the beginning by adding a new data source. So as we select Snowflake, um, this is our Snowflake server. One thing I want to point out that will be important, as you, especially as you create data sources, is to leave this role blank. Um, if you supply your own role, um, it's not possible for other people to authenticate if they need to go in and edit it. But if you leave this optional, it will just bring up their, the um, OAuth, and then anyone else who would have access to that data would be able to then authenticate and maybe edit that data source. So anyone on your team basically would be able to do that. Go through the sign in process. That's all happening on my other screen, but it's happening, I promise. All right. Um, as we're building a data source that is intended to be used for my multiple people, um, it is all right for us to use the reporting warehouse. And if you yourself don't have access to that, we can we can ac submit access request to do that so that you can develop through that. That is the same warehouse that we were using for SciSense queries. It's a medium sized warehouse. And the goal is to have all of right now to kind of mirror that, we're gonna have to try and get all of our Tableau reporting onto using this warehouse. <clears throat> so then we need to select our database. 
This always takes a minute because it goes and tries, it goes and finds all the schemas and all the tables. But it shouldn't be too, too bad. So we're going to go get our workspace engineering. Um, it was the issue, internal issue enhanced, or is that what we're building? I don't remember. Building issue history, so we need internal issue enhanced. We're building a join from issue history. So internal issue enhanced. There it is. So we all we have to do is grab the table and we can drag it out. So this gives us this object that represents our table. This is actually one layer of abstraction above the table, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, it's just important for you to kind of recognize this and get familiar with what's going on here. We can add filters directly to this whole process here. This whole canvas here is what we refer to as Tableau, the Tableau data modeling space. You can add filters, you can see the columns, um, and then you could refresh the data to see a sample of what that data would look like. But one of the things we want is the label history. So when, as we bring this out, in this interface, we see that it immediately gets connected to it. And what this kind of connection is called is a relationship. Relationships are a level of abstraction above table joins. So when you're writing a query, you're going to write left join, inner join, right join, whatever it is. This is a level of, of, of abstraction above that. And what it lets us do as we define this relationship, we said, if we need to look at both of these tables in the same view, join them this way. Is that clear? Does that make sense? So it's not the join, but we're going to define it like a join. And there are some particulars and some details that you can get into for performance, like if you know it's many to many or many to one, all those kinds of things. Uh, but that just know that those extra tuning dials are there, but we're going to try and, and build this out as if it was a join. So we go back to here. Um, we look at severity. Now we don't have to worry about left join, inner join. Tableau, with this extra layer of, of abstraction, Tableau is going to basically take care of that for us. Again, we can kind of fine tune it with our many to minis, but um, we're not going to worry too much about that. Now, this first one could be done as a filter. We could just say, hey, filter this labels table to where label type equals severity. But we should also be able to apply it in the join as a only bring in the severity type. I haven't tried this, but this is how what it would look like. I mean, I've built it, but I haven't actually done it. So we would come over to our labels history, label type. And we want that to equal a calculated field of severity. And then we can continue to add more fields. Um, what was the next field? I'm going to move this over to my second monitor so I can reference it more easily. Um, we want issue ID and dim issue ID. So we want dim issue ID and issue ID. We want these to be equal. Now, the next join, I guess I'll bring it back for this comment. Oh, good. Thank you for scrolling away from me. Uh, the next join actually is on to the dates, but we don't have the dates brought in yet. So we can't actually yet perform this relationship. We can't actually build this relationship. So now I'm going to show you the second part um, of second way you can build tables and connect them together in the Tableau data modeling space. So with each of these objects, as I said, they are an abstraction. We can actually go into them. And this item here represents the table itself. And so when we want to do a direct join, we want to come in here, and this is where we will perform the joins. And we want to join the dim date here directly. And I'm not saying that this methodology is the best practice on how you I would exactly build this for this use case. I'm using this as an example of how to show you the different um, methods of combining things. So 
it's not a tutorial on building this table. It's a guide on how to build tables, how to build your data sources. So as we bring this one out and we drop it into this space, into the canvas, it's going to say, okay, let's join the table. How do you want to join it? Uh, based on our other, the query we're trying to match, we're going to do an inner join and we want it to be on, I'm, I'm simplifying the query that's the, the join that's there on the dates to issues, just again, for sake of the example, but we're going to join on issue created at, I've already lost it. There it is. And we want this to be um, date actual. Now, something to note, and we'll get into, we'll have a problem with it if we later, but these are different uh, data types. One created at is a timestamp, the uh, date actual is a date. And so we want to make sure that these are going to match up. And the way we did that in the query, where we do it in the query is we would truncate, we did a date trunk on the uh, created at. And so we can do the same thing here, or we can go into the calculation and we can apply a date trunk. The syntax is, is different than Snowflake syntax, just a little bit, but a lot of the same functionality, some, some of the same functionality is there. But we can apply a date trunk to this um, at the time of calculation. And so we know that that's going to get the day of the created at, and that's going to be equal to the date actual. And we also want closed at to be, and I'm just going to pick um, uh, another date that we can, it's not what the join was, but you, you'll get, you understand the idea. And again, we're going to date trunk this. All right, so now we have this dim date and it's joined inner join to internal issues enhanced. And as we look, as we started building this, we can come down here and see that it's joining the tables together. And we could even do an update of the table to see the data, but it's showing us all the columns from all of the tables. And we'll get into to those in a second, but I just wonder if this right now is, is joining it. So now that we've done that, we can see that the icon here has changed. It says, hey, there's more than one physical table in this relationship. But now we can come back to our, our, our relationship here, and we can add more fields. So again, if we want to now include the dates, we want dates actual to be, uh, what is it? We the, in the SQL query we used to between. So that's just a, we want it to be greater than or equal to uh, label valid from. Now see here in the relationships is where we get a type mismatch. It's a little more particular. It's going to actually yell at you if it's not doing right. And it says, you can't even preview the data. This isn't going to work. So this is where we have to come in here and, you know, again, add a calculation. We need to make this return a timestamp. And we do that with this date time um, calculation in Tableau. Once we do that, it says, OK, these are the same data types. This is fine. I'll we'll have to do that again because we want it to be less than valid two. Again, we edit this. So now this is working. We have our tables. We have one table that's joined directly. We have another table that's um, related to the other table. Relationships are valuable when you might need to analyze the table separately and together. So especially like say we, if we join these together and it changed the grain of the table, it increased the number of rows and that would throw off some sums or some averages or anything like that. But so having them only related, if I'm only looking at data, say I want to look at counts of labels, 
I could look at that without the green change that I get from joining it to internal history. And it would only query the label history table. It wouldn't actually perform that join. And so that's why relationships can be valuable. Um, whereas if we did just the inner join, we'd have to do something funky like, okay, I have to remember to do account distinct, or I have to do some sort of more complicated calculation to get only the, the number of records from the original one. And so these, this abstraction is helpful for those reasons. Are there any questions on this, um, how we combine tables in, in the Tableau data modeling space? Awesome. I'm, hopefully I explained it clearly enough. Um, once you get into it and you start trying to poke things and push things around, you might have some more questions. You can maybe reference back to this to see what we've done. Oh, that's the wrong one. It won't matter, but I just noticed that I did it wrong. Um, okay. Um, so let's talk on, let's move on to some of the best practices for data source creation. Let me go back to my other notes. All right. We'll use this as an example. Um, removing columns. With, again, with the idea that this is a curated experience. We want to make sure that those who are going to be using it and the reports that are going to be made from it only have the columns that they need or might need. You know, as we're building something that is is intended to be used for an unknown number of uh, visualizations, we don't just limit it to the ones we know. We can expand it to the ones that should be of value. But if we know that there are you know things that won't be of value, we can go ahead and eliminate them. A common one might be. We don't have them in this table. In a lot of tables, there's this dbt updated at, which may not be relevant for a lot of the things. Or like when we, we've joined date here, we might have to join date several times. We can say, oh, well, we're never going to actually need to look at the quarter actual. You know, we can just go in and start hiding columns. Hiding columns, you know, we can select, okay, we really don't need any of these date fields over to here, and we can just hide them. Um, so it leaves us with a much more pared down list of tables. Maybe maybe we don't need sub label subtype. We can just hide them. As you're working on that, you'll you know, this is where the curation comes in. You you pick and choose, and you can always is it going to let me do it from here? I have to go to the other show hidden fields. Um, you can show them, and if you're like, wait, which ones did I hide again? Um, and you can see them hidden. In the viz space, you can when you're showing them, it'll be grayed out, meaning that they're hidden. Well, let's go back to the data source view for a minute. Um, but he, so that's and also removing columns will improve query performance. So we won't be trying to <clears throat> because sometimes, I mean, snow. It all depends on how Snowflake is going to interpret the query as well. What's needed, but um, generically speaking, the fewer columns, the better the experience, both for the end user and for the query. So that's removing columns. Let's talk about renaming. Um, I listed it as renaming columns. And so any of these columns, you can come down and rename. That simply. Um, and the idea is, you know, Tableau will take a first go at a renaming. So we can see here that the original name is L in caps, camel case, snake case. It's all snake case because that's how we build column names in the data warehouse. And so it's going to try and recreate that or it's kind of do, do something different. But maybe it's it's put this in sentence case or a, a proper case, I think is what it's called, where just the first word, first letter of each word is capitalized. And maybe we don't want that. Maybe we don't want of capitalized. And so we would come in here and say, no, that's not proper. That's not how we want it. And we can go through and edit them. After you've created the data source and new columns are added, like say in the database table, they're going to come in looking at the database name. And so we would then want to come in and completely rename them. 
but you can rename any of these objects, including the name of this data source. So if we, so right now it's it's giving us the full full detailed name, um, and really what this was we were building was issue history. We could just rename it there. Again, the idea for renaming is the curated user experience. So you need to think through who should be using this table and who could use this table. I went through and processed a data source for the sales org, and there's a lot of acronyms, a lot of acronyms I didn't understand. And so I had to go and get them, say, OK, what does this mean? How should I label this? Some of the acronyms stayed. Some of the acronyms didn't. So the, again, the idea of renaming is so that it's clear when you go to use that data source what um, it means and what it is. So keep that in mind as you go through it and label and things like URL. Again, if it's it should, if it's obvious that that's the UR, a URL, that should be fine. But is it a, what URL is it? Maybe this needs to be relabeled to say issue URL or something like that to make it more clear. Um, you know, here's an acronym, SUS, impacting. You might know what that is, and if you're the only audience for it, that might be fine. But again, keep in mind transparency. If someone else was coming to use this table, would they know what that means? Um, additionally, you can add des descriptions when you're building things. Um, it is the... Now I have to remember, I didn't pre prepare this one. Under default properties, comment. You can add a more full description here. Um, we're relying mostly on the dbt docs to provide most of our description, so you wouldn't have to worry about this too much. But if you had a complicated calculated field that you baked into the data source, this would be a good place. That, you know, It would be good to document that here. Um, and let's move on to my next topic around creating calculated fields um, in the data source. Again, I'll do it from this view. Um, we can do that. We can just create a calculated field. Um, many of the fields that we saw in our original table, if we go back to that. So say we need, we wanted to create this, right? We could come in here, bring in some of our logic. The, it, the logic is slightly different. I just brought it in here for a quick um, thing. Um, we could create this calculated field. Again, the syntax is different, and we'd have to go through and modify it. But we could then create that, and it's now part of the table. If we come over here, we can find our um, SLO breach counter. Now, what, so when we save this, this field will be available for use, but not edit. If someone is just connecting to the data source to, to build a data visualization, say an explorer, they won't be able to edit this calculated field. They'll be able to create their own new ones, but they won't be able to edit this one. So that's something that's important to remember. Um, I've talked for a bit minute now. Um, are there any questions on what we've discussed so far about removing columns, renaming columns, or creating calculated fields? I have one question, and it relates yes. more to the removing columns. Mm -hmm. So in particular, is there a difference in performance at all, or does it make a difference whether we remove them or hide them the way you showed it versus creating a like dragging in a custom SQL or like a new SQL connection and selecting the specific uh, column names that way before so if you're using the relationship. If you use a custom SQL to define the columns, it will be less performant than hiding the columns on okay. a, if you just drag the, the whole table object in. Um, the reason is because of how Tableau has to treat that SQL. Basically, it will go and query, use the custom query in its totality, bring that in, and then do any other relationships with it. If you just define that, if you use the table object to define it and just hide the columns, then it will never go and query those columns. 
Snowflake will know if the column is used late, you know, and it won't won't bring it in. Like, so you know, it's it's Snowflake smart enough to help out there, but it's also again remembering there's a there's a query experience, you know, the the the, uh, the builder experience, the explorer and viewer experience there. But yes, it, it will always be it will be more performant to not use custom SQL. Interesting. Thank you. It's good to know. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else did I have in my list here? Uh, grouping columns. So let's say we need all of the columns that we have. You know, we, that's, for example, like when I brought over those sales marts, they had hun well over 100 columns um, and Peter, they needed them all. Peter, can I just before yes. you that? Yes. If you have a really compl complicated column in Tableau that you make a calculated field, it will be more performant to have that in the SQL extract than it would be to have it in there. So like if you need to do really specific stuff, you might end up using something called a level of detail calculation. Those take a long time for Tableau to process. And if you're using extracted data sources, if it's in the SQL, it's faster to have it in the SQL of the extract. So just an addendum to that. Um, that's worth keeping in mind as you get into developing and you start developing crazy weird fields. Yeah. Hopefully you don't do long, but yeah, there's some crazy things and there's even, um, and it might be relevant to you. I noticed like in it, there are ways to just pass the SQL directly down to Snowflake. For example, Tableau doesn't know what arrays are. When you bring in an array field, it's just a string. So if you need to perform an array calculation, you have to pass that raw SQL as a function within Tableau. And those aren't as performant either because it's it can't do any of its own optimization. So anytime that, Anytime you can do something directly into the table, it'll be more performant. And Tableau is good, but Snowflake having it already materialized as a Snowflake table will always be more performant. So anytime you can drag those down, better. Um, but going back to our notion of curating the user experience. So we have multiple tables here. And right now, all of the fields that we brought in are grouped by those tables, by those relation um, abstracts that we saw earlier. And so right now, they're grouped by data source table. Um, but let's say that's not the grouping that we needed. So we go here to group by folder. And now they're all just in one big list until we start creating our folders. And you create folders by just selecting the columns you want. And it is folders, create new folder. Um, this isn't a good, um, these aren't good for column names. This is an example. Um, but now you can say these are all related. Put them here together. So as you build them out, you can start collapsing them and save that as the default state. Everything will then be into folders that should make the user experience faster. It's like, OK, I need to go here to get to these, these Boolean values. And again, that should be a transparent thing. So when they come in, they're not like, where am I going? There is a search bar, and I use it all the time. But your goal is to make it transparent, easy. Less thought needs to be put into saying, where do I find it? Um, so that's, what, that's how you group things. Again, the I, I'm going to hammer on these principles, curated user experience. So for someone not you, who may be less familiar with the data, how would you want to group these to make it easy? That should kind of be the guiding principle. Um, what else did I put on here? I, this was kind of just started, I started listing out grab bag of things. Um, data source filters. Again, I, I mentioned that at the beginning, if you apply a filter to the data source, and then you publish it as a data source, that filter will be there for everybody and you won't be able to change it. People will be able to add additional filters when they build it out, but they won't be able to, um, Explore won't be able to affect a change. You can add data source filters here. So we would say date actual, um, we'll do relative date. It's gonna take a minute. And let's say we just wanna look at the last three days. And so if we save that and then we publish it, this data source will only ever have the last three days in it as a query. It'll only ever query the last three days. And that's all that will be available to someone connecting to that data source. And they won't be able to extend that back. 
any farther. So it's a both a it's it's a double edged sword. If you want them to have as much data as possible, you only filter as much as you need, and then let them filter it farther when they create their own view. Um, but at the same time, you can increase performance and just a general curated exploration capabilities by filtering it to only the things relevant. That's topical, if I say, for this data source that you're creating. Um, I mentioned next on my list is connection credentials, which I mentioned where we want to leave the role optional, a role blank. Um, and let's see, last on my list is data source extracts. So when you're developing a data source to be published, we need to think about extracts. Your query may be very performant. It may not be. But if you want this, an extracts can help with that. What an extract is, is, is Tableau will, will house the data in its own internal, in, on its server, in its new database type, and it can access it better from memory. So it is, it'll be more performant than querying the table. However, there are limitations. We have a total storage capacity on Tableau that accounts for all workbooks, all data extracts, and so we can't just extract everything, even though there might be more performant. We have to pick and choose. If you're developing locally and you wanted to use an extract, those are all fine. But when we go to publish it, then we want to default to a live connection. Because as you extract something, again, it's going to take a copy of that data. But these are also valuable. So it's like, I'm, I'm trying to teach you that how to use them, but warn you against using them. Or rather, it's a tool in the toolbox, but we don't always use it. Something to keep um, in mind is that the extract has its own set of filters. So you can apply it will if you have a data source filter, it will bring this in, but you can add additional filters and it will ex extract based on those filters. I made this mistake where I had a data source filter with one date range and an extract filter with a different date range. And so I had, I was, look, the data source filter was the last three days, but I haven't hadn't extracted for like 10 days. And so I was getting nothing because the extract was a certain date range. And they don't, they don't, they only sync when you refresh the extract. But when we're talking, if we ever get into role level security and extracts, you know, there's ways to do that. We need to use, you know, the physical tables. We can, refresh incrementally, where it's only going to add new rows based on a certain column. These are valuable tools. And it, when we start talking about performance, we will use them. But we, when we, even then, we have to start talking about how much data are we really bringing in. Um, I don't think that the engineering team here has a lot of data, but there are other teams that they regularly query gigabytes of data, um, return gigabytes of data in their queries. And if we started extracting all of those, we would run out of space very quickly. Um, extracts was the last item on my list of things to discuss. So now I want to open it up for questions on what I've talked about and any other general questions about creating data sources. Um, I guess I'll just go back to the question that I posted here. I think mm -hmm. I have a, I, I didn't understand the, the previous comment where I tagged it um, regarding uh, Rao was asking about the desired long-term approach. And you said that it's best to stick with the published data sources. And how I understood it was, oh, using whatever table that's published in the um, Tableau virtual connection. So I think those are two different things. And they are. where can I find the published data sources then? So your team is going to be responsible for creating the published data sources. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what this training is for. So you will go about it kind of as I walk through the beginning, connect the date, connect directly to Snowflake, and then publish the data source. I didn't actually show pushing the buttons of publishing a data source. But after you've done everything that we showed, um, I mean, we'll just bring it back up. 
I remember playing around with it a little bit and I remember clicking the publish data sources and it just mm -hmm. kind of asked me to select a folder where the data should be. And that's where I found a lot of the existing tables in Snowflake was already in Tableau. That's why I was like, oh, yeah. if it's already in Tableau, then I can just use it. Why do I need to republish it kind of? That's good. Um, and we'll talk about virtual connections in a moment to answer that question. So once we've created this data source, um, all you would have to come over here to do is um, publish to server. Um, and that will ask us to connect. I won't go through that. It'll just ask you to connect. It'll give you a name and it'll ask you to put it in a location. Maybe I can do this quick. My connection can be different and difficult sometimes because I have access to several things. So um, I'll resolve that later. Again, it's, it's similar to publishing workbooks from their desktop. Um, it'll just be a different file type. It'll ask you for a location and about embedding the credentials. This is probably why I had it on my notes. When you publish the data source, it is okay for you to embed your credentials for your team. Long-term, like so you're in development and you just need to work on it or you want multiple people to use, be able to use it, you can embed your credentials. Long-term, we have a service account that we will put in there when we want to publish the data source into production. That is a username and password that the data team will put in there and that will just, it'll work for everybody. So that just as a side note there, I forgot that in my in my script. To get back to your other question about you saw all the tables or the connections there, the scheme is there. Those were probably virtual connections and mm -hmm. we're actually going to be moving away from using those. We wanted to use them in a specific way. They don't really support it. They're non-performant. We'll reevaluate later in the future. Um, but even as like specifically to the question you had in the agenda, if a new column is added in a table, in Snowflake, that table, uh, it should it should pick up this the virtual connection should pick up the new columns, but it may not. It won't pick up new tables. It all has to do manually, um, and it's not as performant. So we're going to slowly be de we're going to be decommissioning the virtual connections that you're seeing, and then relying on the analyst teams to build out published data sources for the explorer to those who those who are going to be explorers. So like I said, that, that'll be your team's responsibility to build out those public data sources for the engineering uses or whoever else you support. It would be your team's responsibility to build them out. And that's why we're focusing have so heavily on the curation of the data sources. Does that answer? Okay, now that makes sense. The question, yeah, okay. That makes a lot more sense because I, I was... When I saw those tables, I, I was really confused. I was like, why do we need to republish that? But now knowing the virtual connection and the yeah performance yeah. difference, then yeah, that makes sense. And the, um, and yeah. the there, there's still a, we shouldn't be publishing something that somebody already has notion. So that's a yeah. good thought to have. Like, wait a minute, someone's already done this. But if you're the owner of the data, internal issue history or engineering issues, and someone else has a published data source, you should be going in and asking them why, or you should be working mm. together to collaborate and combine. Um, you'll see this, uh, the people team is very earnest in their desire to own the people data. So if, if you publish a employee directory, they, and they already have one, they're gonna be like, hey, why don't we work together to give, make sure mm. you have what you need in our employee directory? They're going to try and be watching for that and take ownership of, things that are exclusively people data. And you could do the same. It's like, hey, I noticed that you're looking at MR close rate for your team. We have this data source over here that has all that in it already. Does it have everything you need or can we help you add things that you need to it? And that's how the ownership of data sources should go. And right now it's gonna be on the teams to, to look, to ask questions, to know or have a data catalog. So that as you publish, create a data source, for production use so that you know, multiple people can use it. We want to add that to the data catalog. It's a handbook page. So if you're looking for a data source, you should go to the handbook page and say, what data sources are there and what do they have? I don't see anything like what I think I need. I'm going to go build my own. I'm going to go build a new one for my team. Or, oh, I see that people already has a headcount, something that should have headcount in it. I'm going to go use that. And rather than trying to create your own from the data that you might have access to. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now that actually 
uh, now I have a second question related mm -hmm. to that comment. So you know how in Sciences we could actually query what Sciences have and every single chart they have a query, I can easily just query what charts are using this particular snippet. Is there mm -hmm. a similar functionality in Tableau? Because the data sources are gonna get published, you know, like many times, like the new tables mm -hmm. are gonna be added or snippets. Is there a way for us to query what's being added yeah. and like what charts are being used? I think that's a pretty useful function for uh, yeah, collaborations. Logged in here properly. Um... General answer is yes. Let me sh let me try and show you um, what that looks like. Um, it's a little more. It's a little different. Um, I gotta get logged back in here. Hold on. Um, trying. It's telling me that Tableau is not available. Can you get to Tableau? Gosh, so let me try. I haven't tried yet. So I, I've been in there today once. I've done several things. Oh, um, I just. Just give me the same error. Okay. Um, I would show you, Trang, maybe you have something to do early this morning to help us figure out why Tableau, how, why the page is, is available. I will pay. 503 for me as well. <laughs> okay. It's not just me. Um, no. There is, you can go to the data source itself and there's a tab there called lineage. And that will give you a count of the workbooks that are connected to it. It'll also tell you which tables are being used in it. There's also a section in Tableau called external assets. And so you can go and find, it should be taking basically a note of the table that we're pulling in from Snowflake. And you say, hey, where is this table being used? And similarly trace its lineage to the works, the works that are being used. We are working for, that's all through the use UI in Tableau. We are, <laughs> we have a plan to develop additional tools, maybe a report that'll make it easier to go and find those things in the future. But right now it's, really for the creators to say, go into the UI, say, okay, where's this, I, I have this issue, enhanced engineering issues, who, where's it being used? Okay, I see it's already in three different data sources. Let's go, let me collaborate with them and talk to them about enhancing them or consolidating them into one. That's how we would find it. Sounds good. Peter, this might be the issue why you couldn't connect to Tableau Cloud uh, or publish to the server earlier yeah it is it's the same error so um hopefully we get that resolved soon because i have a lot of work to do in top load today um <laughs> are there any other questions we're coming up at time i have one final one um so just to be clear when we start publishing these data sources uh are we going to be publishing the data sources to where those data sources are now the resources i guess folder is there a specific i guess again i'm uh my big thing right now is just thinking about organization mm -hmm. are we just going to put it all in that one folder under our engineering project or do we have the ability to you know create subfolders or directories where we can you know we can have all issue type data here all mr type data in here all mm -hmm. You know, to just make it easier, just thinking, because, um, yeah, engineering, we end up dealing with a lot of different tables right. and teams don't really care about them sometimes. Yeah. So the resources project is designed for those workbooks and our data sources that the enterprise central data team is going to own and manage. So if we're, we might go through and say, take all of our tables that are marked tables and create a published data source for them. And we'll put them into the resources folder. If you're building something for the explorers that are you know, going to be signed up for engineering, it's okay for you to publish your data source in your section, in your project, in the engineering projects. Uh, again, you can move from, from dev to ad hoc to production, just like the workbooks. And so you can house that with the workbooks. We're, we're moved away from having different folders for the different types of uh, things like data sources versus workbooks. There's icons you can filter and sort by those. So there's just wherever you would put workbooks, you can put the data sources. Um, and yes, we can talk about, We I know we, Roel, you and I have talked about a more granular project structure and how that, how that can fit in. Um, and yes, you can. 
we can work out an additional project structure as as you need it. You know, as the, as the scope of the project increases, again, it's for making the user experience more tangible, more usable. And so if you are having hundreds and hundreds of workbooks and you don't want people to have to use the search tools just to find them, new projects. If, you know, but kind of deal with that as, as we need. We have the three levels of hierarchy, a folder structure rather, already in the handbook. And so adding a, adding a fourth that's custom for your project um, is reasonable and we can work. We just need to work with uh, Trang and the, and the BI team to build those in and so we can make sure they're permissioned properly. In the dev space, you can create your own. We're not controlling those. So if you want to trial it out and try and figure it out, move things around, build projects, close projects, in the dev space, you should be able to do that. But as you move into the ad hoc and production space, that will require the BI team's uh, support to build those. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll stop the recording. <laughs>